Each new truth destroys the one held before it. The jolting results collapse one upon the other when the foundation is shaken, the one upon which they were supported. In the history of human culture and science, viewpoints, which had once become worthy dogmas, have had to experience more than once that they one day no longer held water. The deeper we are forced into the countless forms of the appearances in nature, the more is the unforeseen more obvious, the more plentifully have we had to learn afresh. That is uncomfortable, and doubly uncomfortable when it is a matter of presuppositions that have become foundations of government, tradition, society, and religion. Well, let's just wait a little bit more. Currently, there is a bit of a debate in the trans community about who is really trans. Some people say that as long as you identify as trans, well, then you are trans. If you want to be trans, then you are trans. And I am personally of this persuasion myself. But there are some people who say that you need to be diagnosed as trans. This second group sometimes calls themselves transsexuals or transmedicalists as opposed to those trans-trenders, who only identify as trans because it's trendy and fun and popular now, and these youths, you know, how they do things. Now, this video is unfortunately going to be a little bit binary. I am a binary trans woman, and this is a subject often brought up by other binary trans people. But I think it's important that, you know, us transsexuals also say something about it. Now, I'm not going to tell you why non-binary trans people or trans people who don't experience dysphoria are trans. Instead, I'm going to try to explain why some people desperately want to say that they aren't. But I do think that this question has been slightly misinterpreted by our side to be more about identity and self-hatred than I think it might actually be. Because I don't think that's where most transsexuals are coming from. What if the transsexuals are onto something more than that? I won't be defending anyone in this video. I will be explaining what I think are different points of view on the issue, even though I don't agree with most of them. And I definitely will not be defending the true transsexuals that want to exclude seemingly as many people as possible from calling themselves trans. There's this idea among many transsexuals that they have the historical basis behind them. That the word transsexual used to mean something, and I'll get to that later. But I mean, just, just, just look at this, like, transsexual used to mean someone that had transitioned hormones and or surgery. Transsexual used to mean someone who actually had the sex change. There is still only two. Now, to discuss this video, you need to know some things about me. I am a transsexual, and I'm going to use the term here, even though I don't necessarily think that it's something that I would apply to myself. The first time I went to the gender clinic, I was 19 years old, and this was 2012. I hadn't come out to anyone at this point. Uh, and, you know, 2012 was a different time. I thought that the doctor would think that I was like some perverted sex freak. No one really talked about being trans yet. I mean, I didn't even know of another trans person at this point. The first trans person I ever met was me. And back then I didn't really know what terms to use. So when I came out, I came out as transsexual because that's, I thought that was the term that people used. And I hadn't even heard of, of the term non-binary, I think, for maybe three or four years into my transition. I, uh, yeah, like the, the concept, the concept to me in 2012 was completely alien to me. In those early days too, there weren't really forums to talk about it either. Uh, I mean, they existed, but they were mostly run by like porn stars or like online trans sex workers. Uh, so those are the people that I talked to online primarily. primarily. <laughs> so there I was sitting in the doctor's office, like with my back against the door, uh, because it was like a really tiny room. Uh, telling telling my doctor, my male doctor, that like, hi, um, uh, I want to be a woman. <laughs> like, I think that those were the words I used in Swedish, obviously. Um, and I did it based on the advice of like, porn stars on the internet. 
but you know, the conversation went okay. He didn't think I was a perverse sex freak, uh, which is, I'm thankful for that. Um, if only he knew. <laughs> Uh, and this was 2012, so you know I I knew the what the what the law was back then, um, you know uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, I wouldn't be able to do certain things. Um, I wasn't allowed to be fertile if I wanted to do any like treatment or legal change. I would need to be sterilized uh, because that was the law back then. Uh, but I didn't I didn't think about it. You know I I was 19. I didn't really want kids um, at that point. Uh, and, you know, besides, you know, the surgery sterilizes you anyway, so it's like, I didn't think about it too much back then. Uh, and besides, like, you know, the, the doctor said that trans people are unfit parents anyway, so, you know, it's fine. Um, but after that, after that first meeting, uh, you know, I didn't get, you know, I didn't get hormones or anything, you know, I didn't, they didn't ship me off the surgery directly, because, you know, shit takes time. Uh, but after that meeting, like, that's when I, that's when I started. That's when I started my transition to, to live as a woman, so to say. Um, and doing that, like just taking those first steps to, to transition, to, to do the things that I wanted to do. I mean, like it was such a mind-numbingly amazing, uh, terrifying. A mental illness is a condition that causes disorder in a person's thinking or behavior. We define disorder by judging if it would have an impact on a person's everyday life, on their ability to live a normal life. That means that two people with the same condition might not be diagnosed as having the same condition, because it might not have the same impact in their normal everyday life. If you have social support, if you have more money, then your condition might not impact you in the same way that it might impact someone else. But the most important part might be, what does a normal life even mean in the first place? When I was in university, I actually studied a fair bit of psychology. And one of the first things that they tell you is that what a mental condition is, what mental unhealth is, is incredibly subjective. And the reason for that is that humans, as we are, are incredibly varied. Do you have an anxiety disorder? Or are you just poor and your anxiety is actually just coming from not being able to afford food? Doctor, I can't sleep. I can't eat. My parents force me to work in the fields 18 hours a day. I have no time for myself. Yes, I have a diagnosis. You're hysterical. Bye. Historically, all sorts of things have been considered mental illnesses, including, but not limited to, masturbation, oral sex, that kinky thing that all the YouTubers do at the conventions. Being a good, good girl. Anything that was fun, really. Obviously, psychology has been a help to many people, so it's not all pseudoscience trying to control people, but it's hard to ignore that that is a big part of what psychology has historically been. But because of this, and what I mentioned earlier, the line to draw between a mental illness and mental health is not as clear as you might think. The line between someone suffering because of a mental condition and the line between someone not fitting into society because of a mental condition and that is causing them suffering is fuzzy at best. Are you unhappy because you're trans? Or are you unhappy because society treats you like shit for being trans? Or both? <laughs> The source of the condition doesn't really matter as much as the fact that it is, in fact, impacting your life. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't affect your life, well, then you're just expressing humanity. Then you are just a normal person, a varied being. And the lines between them are arbitrary, subjective, and have to be made on a case-by-case -case basis, which is why a psychologist is involved and why you can't really draw a blood test to see if you're trans or not. That's because there is no objective essence of mental illness. Because if you did that, then there would be an objective way to see if someone is acting normally. And you can't really do that. And so the question really boils down to... How do you... Suffer?
So I reviewed our latest session, and I think it's best we wait a bit longer just until you're more comfortable being a woman. I'm not completely convinced you're sure yet, but uh, let's meet again in six months. Now, who are the transsexuals? Well, the people I've mostly seen talk about topics of do you need dysphoria to be trans or not are people mostly like myself. Pretty, white, binary, like it's not all that, but like that is the significant portion of who I see are spreading this type of discourse. I mean, there are always exceptions, but when it comes to excluding people, people like me are doing a pretty good job at it. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that most people on some level want to fit into mainstream society as much as possible. And that is what a lot of people who identify as transsexual also want. And doing that is obviously a lot easier if you already belong to the mainstream in many other categories. And it's especially easy if you're white because, well, most of the Western world is built for our comfort. And I think a similar thing happens with a lot of trans people. They realize by fitting in, they can also avoid many of the worst aspects of being trans. And when you see, for example, right-wing trans women assimilate, both aesthetically and ideologically, you do see them being accepted. But it's not unconditional acceptance. But because this assimilation depends on you being part of the mainstream culture on all aspects, any alternative to that aspect that you could have taken need to be ignored. And so I think for many trans people who actively choose to be, you know, transsexuals in mainstream society, who want to pass and so on, I think it hurts when in the eyes of other trans people that choice is a bad one. But as I mentioned, I am a transsexual. I do want to assimilate. I do want to be part of mainstream culture as any other woman. And so sometimes, when our side says that, oh, well, you just hate yourself. You just want to hate aspects of yourself so that you can be palatable to mainstream society. I think that's kind of reductionist. I think that's a bit rude, too. Of course, not everyone wants that. But there is an opinion among some trans people that you should want that. And if you're not, you're working against other trans people that do. And that's because they honestly think that being part of mainstream society and conforming more to cis standards is the best way for mainstream acceptance for trans people. They think that any outliers to that system will paint them guilty by association. They think that if you act in a way that mainstream society doesn't like, they will be painted guilty by association and will be rejected from society because of what someone else did. And you can kind of see where that's coming from, because that's something that mainstream society, patriarchal society, they do that. But the solution proposed by the true transsexuals is to accept it and embrace it, rather than change how society operates. To buy into the whole soccer mom ideal lifestyle, big tits and vagina included. And that was the default position for me when I began my transition. In 2012, everyone told me that like, no, you, you need to assimilate. There is no community. If you go alone, you will die. The plan that everyone told me in the beginning was either to get into porn or to get all my surgeries, work on my voice, save up some money, uh, get all my papers done, get all my surgeries done, uh, move to a new city, cut all connections with my former life, and live in hiding, like in living in stealth, as they say. Like you, you hide uh, and you don't let anyone ever know of your former life. Because if you do, you are doomed. You want total assimilation at all costs. And that's it. Like that's what you do. That's the default. <laughs> like that was, that's what everyone told me that I, that I needed to do. Like, and if I didn't do that, then I would be one of the outcasts. Like that, that, like, that was the advice people gave me back in 2012. Like, it's not even, it's not even 10 years ago. And the other thing is, like, I bought into that. I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course I need to do that. Like, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. I mean, maybe I'm just from another generation of trans women, but... 
living through that, like having that be like my my long term plans for life for a significant portion of my early transition, I think I think it helped me understand why some people still think assimilation is the best option today. But I gotta say, that's a very privileged solution. Just become like us and you'll be right as rain. <laughs> and that might work, you know, if you have enough of an income, a social safety net, uh, friends that can support you doing that, uh, maybe some savings to spend on surgery. And you know, that's even easier when you're transitioning into something that society already accepts exists. Women. Being binary is a privilege, in that sense. However, most people can't do all that. Very few can. And I realize the irony in me saying that, but you know, one of the transsexuals had to break rank and say Final possible stage in this disease process is the delusion of a transformation of sex. So I reviewed our latest session, and I think it's best we wait a bit longer. The patient undergoes a deep change of character, particularly in their feelings and inclinations, which just become those of a female. Just until you're more comfortable being a woman. After this, he also feels himself to be a woman during the sexual act, has desire only for passive sexual indulgence, and in certain circumstances sinks to the level of a I'm prostitute. I'm completely convinced you're sure yet. In 1886, sexologist Richard Kraft Ebing published the first edition of his magnum opus, Psychopathica Sexualis. He was actually one of the founding figures of sexology, even if he didn't know it at the time. And his work has gone on to influence almost all of sexual pathology. Psychopathica Sexualis is a medical textbook, named as such for the explicit purpose of scaring away normal people that can't read his very fancy fancy book. If you google it, you'll probably find porn. Sorry. His early editions mostly focused on stuff like fetishism and masturbation and, you know, other things people in the 1880s didn't really like. But in later editions, he brought up the topic of homosexuality. He describes homosexuality as a nervous disease with several stages. The final one is metamorphosis sexualis. All this fake Latin, it's great, I love it. Now Ricky here describes homosexuality in a very modern, progressive way. He doesn't describe it as being a sin. Instead, he describes it as a disease that you can be cured of. Apparently, you can also cure it with sterilization because it prevents onanism if you can't jizz. But I know several trans women who don't even have testicles anymore and they still- Now, Richard describes this as happening in several stages. And I promise you that I'm not joking. First, as attraction to the same sex, while still retaining a dominant role in coitus. Next, the patient exhibits feminine traits and takes on the passive, submissive role of a woman. Finally, the patient believes himself to be a woman, not as delusion, but described as a female soul in a male body by one of his patients. Being afflicted by this final stage is called metamorphosis sexualis. His writings went on to influence many other thinkers and doctors, and eventually laid basically the foundations of modern sexual pathology. And over decades and many other thinkers, this became the dominant view of gender identity and sexuality. In fact, this is the earliest sign I can find for why some people think that being trans is just being more gay, because like that's basically what he, he believed. In the 1800s, their view of sexuality was that, well, if you're attracted to men, then you have to be a woman, because only women are attracted to men, clearly. And so any men attracted to other men were described as being a little bit womanly, until 
eventually, I guess, just the woman just takes over, I guess, or something. And because of this, the idea of sexuality and gender identity being linked have remained in the discourse until basically very recently. But of course, this view of gender identity and sexuality didn't work. So And so eventually, recently, it's starting to fall out of fashion. But because this view of gender identity and sexuality was dominant for so long, even modern pathology or modern doctors still sometimes fall into the traps of 19th century thinking. But he wasn't the only one to think about gender identity and sexuality. A couple of years after Kraftiebing, another man called Magnus Hirschfeld did some thinking. Now he did activism and research on issues like gender identity and sexuality in an institute that he founded in Germany in 1922. <laughs> Now he read the works of Kraftebing, but instead of seeing it as a problem caused by years of homosexuality and onanism, he saw something else. He realized that the suffering his patients were feeling wasn't caused by some internal disease, but rather by society that wouldn't accept them for who they were, except for some of his trans patients. Hirschfeld realized that some people, regardless of their sexuality, wanted to be the other sex. He called this transsexualismus. Transsex transsexualismus. Transsexualismus? He named this condition transsexualismus, which was later translated into English as transsexual. It's worth noting that the person who coined the term said that the only way to find out if someone was trans was to ask them. And you know, the term has updated into being transgender instead of transsexual, but that's just how language evolves a little bit. Uh, instead of the other sex, you know, we now realize that there are more genders, and we talk about gender rather than sex. Uh, and so, you know, but the term basically still today means what it did a hundred years ago. He also pioneered many early gender-conforming surgeries and treatments, because he noted that some of his patients were depressed, that despite wanting to be the other sex, they weren't physically, and that made them sad. And he realized that having surgery would make them less sad. But this had nothing to do with if you were trans or not. As long as you wanted to be some other gender, as we would say today, then you were. And besides, in those days, surgery was cutting edge. It was not really something that most people went through. And so surgery or any form of treatment was never expected for anyone who was labeled under the term transsexual, even by Hirschfeld himself. Instead, Hirschfeld said that people who were homosexual or were trans were simply part of the human variance of expression. Although, to be fair, Twitter didn't exist in those days, so. Oh, Magnus, you trender. You can't just invent a new term like that. You can't say that they're transsexuals. They have a mental disease called metamorphosis sexualis. You trender. But the most important takeaway from this is that Hirschfeld, the coiner of the term transsexual, never wanted to pathologize anyone labeled under it. It was simply a description. Some people may be sad and have depression because of their bodies, and that they should have surgery if they want to. And that was it. That was the extent of trans discourse in 1922. So I get pretty like angry when I hear other transsexuals say that like, oh well it used to be this way, or like transsexual used to mean something, and like you you used to have requirements for this shit, and it's like, no, like, no, the requirements are a very recent thing. And, the, like, the person who invented the term just said, like, do you wanna? Great! Compared to today, with all our labels, and discourse, and communities, and bickering about requirements, or stuff. Doesn't it seem easier? Doesn't it all seem simpler back then? So the people arguing that you need dysphoria to be trans, they are the ones adding meaning to the word that wasn't there before. They are the trenders. So the modern idea of the transsexual or the transmedicalist community or whatever, they have no historical basis. Instead I see a lot of people basing their views on the writings of Kraft Ebing instead, who pathologizes the idea of gender identity and has diagnostic criteria and etc etc. However, in the defense of transmedicalists, 
the view of Kraft Ebing is the one that became mainstream. So I can see why someone would think that they have the historical basis on their side, when in fact they don't. The medical community may have adopted the terms that Hirschfeld used, but they also adopted the diagnostic criteria and pathologic view of gender identity that was proposed by Kraft Ebing instead. But there's more to it, isn't it? Like, it doesn't have really to do with, with history or medical science. Like, it doesn't matter. There's more to it, isn't there? There's more suffering. Final possible stage in this disease process is the delusion of a transformation of sex. The patient undergoes a deep change of character, particularly in their feelings and inclinations, which just become those of a female. After this, he also feels himself to be a woman during the sexual act, has desire only for passive sexual indulgence, and in certain circumstances, sinks to the level of a prostitute. I think it's best we wait a bit longer, just until you're more comfortable being a woman. The point that I was eventually going to make in this chapter was that, well, many transsexuals are stuck in the mindset of sexual pathology, but I already talked about Kraft Ebing. And I already talked about Magnus Hirschfeld. And this, this information is common knowledge. It's not common knowledge, but it's like it's commonly available, right? Um, like defini the definition of transsexu transsexualism, right? It doesn't matter. The definition of transsexualism doesn't matter. The, the historical implications of, of the term and uh, the historical like nature of, of, of LGBT pathology doesn't matter, does it? Like, cause, cause you can go find it out. The people are still assholes about who can be trans or not. So where's it coming from? Really? Uh, because logically it shouldn't exist. Originally, I wanted to talk about my own view of my own trans hood, uh, you know, because I am pretty stereotypically trans. I, I, I match, I match the mold of what you imagine when you imagine a trans woman. Like that's that's me, and that's because like by any definition, I am a transsexual. You know, I'm going to get the surgery. I have dysphoria. I suffer for my womanhood. Ugh. But also because I think that, you know, obviously there are many different ways of being trans uh, and I think like obviously this includes like binary and non-binary trans identities uh, and even within binary identities right because like trans women and trans men are having incredibly different experiences uh, but also like I, I think there is a difference between trans people who who experience dysphoria and trans people who don't uh, it's just that I don't think that difference matters <laughs> right <laughs> like I think it's, I think it's there. So, okay, I'm not a dick. Like, I know that my experience of being trans is my own and I don't really expect anyone else to have that experience either. Like, I'm not gonna go around and tell people like you're not trans because your experience isn't universally identical to mine. Like, <laughs> that's, that's a very like, <laughs> that's a very shitty thing to do, I think. Like telling other people that unless their experience is like yours, then they're not valid, like, fuck off. So I think that anyone who calls themselves trans is trans. Dysphoria doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, like, like, now I want to say but, but if I say the word but, then I sound like a transmedicalist, so okay, I'm gonna say it like this. <laughs> I've been transitioning now for seven years, uh, and as I mentioned in the very beginning, when I started, it was illegal in Sweden for trans people to be fertile and have any treatment. Um, so if I wanted to change my legal name, like just, a, just something bureaucratic, like if I wanted to change my ID, it was like, no, that's snip snip. That also meant that I didn't have a right to free sperm in a fertility clinic because that would technically potentially make me fertile. Because those could be used to make a baby. Uh, and you can't have that. Um, uh, and because, you know, hormone treatments can sometimes potentially sterilize you, depending on the brand and depending on strength and whatnot. Um, 
it can mess up for your fertility in any case. So I had a decision to make. Uh, and despite the law being changed in like 2013, I didn't know that in 2012. Like I had no idea back then, like how things would change in the future. Like maybe things would never change. So anyway, fertility in 2012 was this, this big thing for me because uh, I faced this choice between, okay, I can either wait like, I don't go on hormones. I wait potentially forever or, like, until I have kids. Or until the law changed, which could be... It could be next year, which it was. Uh, or it could be forever. Or I could or I could go on hormones. And, like, transition, like, the way I wanted to do it. Um, which is a big... Like, that's a pretty big decision for a 19-year-old to do. Um... Anyway, in 2012, I met my doctor, and I told him that I felt like shit. And I told him that I wanted to be a woman, like, based on the advice of a porn star on the internet. And, um... Anyway, so in 2012, I felt like shit, uh, so I started to self-medicate. I bought hormones on the internet, uh, because you can do that instantly. Um, and I paid for it myself, because that's how you do on the internet, on the, on the dark web. And the doctors told me that as long as I was a good trans, as long as I exhibited all the symptoms, and as long as I was a good girl... And then eventually I would get my, my hormones within a year, and I would get all my surgeries within two. I got my hormones within three years, and uh, it's been seven years now, and I'm still waiting for, for my surgeries. Um, and you know, that sucks, right? Because that means I, sp so I spent three years paying, like, a lot of money to, to get my, my, my hormones, basically, to, to do the thing that I needed to, for my own health, basically, like, uh, so that, co that cost a lot of money and basically made me destitute, um, Almost every single trans person I know now uh, transitioned after I did. Many of them got their hormones like within a year. Uh, some of them actually got their surgeries within like a year and a half, which is like wild. Um, because now the system has changed, like laws have changed and the trans healthcare system has changed. And now, you know, doctors know more and society is more aware. And, you know, the world is more woke now when it comes to trans people, so... You know, people who transition now, they get things faster, which is good. Uh, and many people came out knowing that celebrities were around. Like, they could see, you know, they could see on their epigic, they could see Laverne Cox, and they know, like, oh shit, like, you can be trans. Like, that's a thing that exists in the world. Like, back in 2013, no one talked about being trans. Like, being trans was this, like, bad sex thing that, like, no one did anyway. Like, that was something disgusting and gross. Uh, and going through that, like, without a community, that didn't really exist yet, like, it fucking sucks. Uh, so anyway, I see these people, sometimes younger, sometimes younger than me, um, but sometimes my age, and they begin transitioning now, in the year of our Lord, 2019, and I can see them, you know, you know, they can go to, they can go to a fertility clinic and save their sperm, that's fine, and they can go on hormones, like, right away, and I was like, oh, cool, they don't have to, they don't have to sit and do this decision when they're 19 years old, thinking, like, do I transition or do I have kids in the future, like, ever, like, they, they don't have to do that decision, and, uh, and they don't, maybe they don't have to spend as much money now, because, you know, maybe hormones are cheaper in certain places now, and, uh, you don't need to die, buy them from the dark web anymore, and like you can know people in real life that will help you with dosages, so you don't fuck up your doses like I did uh, over and over again. And I feel myself thinking to these kids or like people transitioning now. And I, I find myself thinking over and over again, like you have no goddamn idea how good you have it. Like you don't know the luxury that you have, and then. I feel like shit. <laughs> and obviously, that logic doesn't work because, you know, suffering is individual and subjective and arbitrary and wh whatever. Like, I don't want to think that, like, but I feel like I do sometimes. So I'm sitting in this chair with my back against the door on the advice of a porn star, 
on the internet telling me like yeah I can be a girl and then I have to contemplate like my entire future like do I want kids and so I can't relate to anyone even if we're both trans because that is what the inescapable transsexual suffering meant to me I had to be in this impossible choice and and I have to and I have to tell you all this because when I see people who describe themselves as like true transsexuals or transmedicalists or whatever I see them having gone through something similar and they think that you need to experience that and you know what the worst thing is about this like I've heard from other trans people since starting my YouTube channel that I have been the source of this to them. Like some people have seen me transitioning in like, you know, my late teens, early 20s, doing my YouTube channel, doing like my thing, living my life and they and they see me and then they think that like, oh, I have it so easy. I, I have it. I like I I have it so good. So and then they feel like shit for thinking that. So we can't win. Like, it just goes round and round. Like, we all just... We're just envious of each other all the time. It's a concept of not being able to let go of the past. Not being able to let go of your own experiences. And be happy for the fact that other generations and future generations are having an easier time with it than you are. And that's really hard. It's not fair. And you know what? It isn't fair. I'm not going to argue that it is. And I think that arguing that it is actually fair is bullshit. <laughs> like, it's not fair. It's not fair that people who transition earlier, time-wise, uh, had to jump through more hoops and had to do more scrutiny with less support. Like, no, it's not fair. I agree it's not fair. That doesn't make it okay to like want to keep it that way though. It seems sometimes cruel when society fixes a problem after you have had to fix it for yourself. But that is what progress looks like. That is what we want to happen. If being trans is actually considered cool and trendy today, which I don't think it is, but even if it was, wouldn't that be a good thing? Almost? I mean, at least compared to how things were 10 years ago, when it was like a weird sex thing that you only did at night. Now, obviously, I don't think that my experiences are universal among transsexuals either, but I do think that there are aspects to the ideas that I have discussed about suffering and the historical background that I think are relevant to why some people still today talk about transgenders and transsexualism. And sure, the true transsexuals might think that the difference between trans people who have dysphoria and who doesn't is significant enough to warrant another label. But that shouldn't be transsexual then, because the creator doesn't agree with you. <laughs> now some people do transition purely based on dysphoria, but some people don't. Some people simply see it being as a better option than the alternative. There are infinite reasons to transition, and they don't have to be based in dysphoria at all. The thing about being trans is that there's no really a correct way to do it. Society thinks that anyone who transitions is basically a bit of a weirdo anyway. I like to think about transitioning in a similar way of mental health, kind of. It doesn't really matter why it's happening. The impact is what matters. Does transitioning have a positive impact on your life? Well, then you're trans, probably. Do you just want to transition? Well, then you're probably trans too. I don't think dysphoria has anything to do with us being trans or not. Neither did the originator of the term. And to be honest, I don't think most trans people do either. I think that the transmedicalist discussion is just a very loud minority among I don't know, millions and millions of trans people that just want to live their lives in silence. No transition is like the other, 
and I think it's fruitless to try to sort them into different categories. And that's just fine. We're all part of the infinite spectrum of human expression. It is uncomfortable when facing a society that is changing. It's easy to hide, to impose limits on yourself that previously society imposed on you. But when society becomes more progressive and more accepting, I think maybe we can start letting go of some of those barriers. Maybe we can start exploring a world that is a bit more simpler. But you can't turn to history, transsexual gang, because, well, history doesn't agree with you. You don't really have the historical camp on your side when the originator of the term transsexual doesn't talk about that. <laughs> Also, no one uses transsexual anymore, transgender is just more, it's just a better term. Uh, and I'm 99% sure Magnus Hirschfeld would agree himself. Like, he just used a term that was appropriate at the time, like a hundred years ago. Like, we can modernize, it's fine. But even if we totally disregard the history behind the term, or the idea of suffering, I still don't think the idea holds up that we should separate ourselves into groups. The inherent logic doesn't hold up either. And, if anything, this minor distinction between different kinds of trans people doesn't matter in the grand scope of things, like in big society. For example, a rich trans person could transition far more than I could in a much shorter span of time. And that kind of experience leads itself to different types of identity as well. So what I'm saying is, give me money on Patreon! <laughs> so I can see the anger. I can see the frustration because I feel it too. I just think that the target is entirely misplaced. Instead of collecting this frustration and taking it out on people who have an easier time than us, why don't we just let it go? And try to be happy for people who come after us. And obviously, if you do identify as trans, feel free to call yourself transsexual. Because that's what daddy would want. And we always do what daddy wants. <laughs> and so obviously I think that non-binary people are trans, if they want to be. Trans people who don't experience dysphoria, yeah, they're trans too. I don't think you need dysphoria or surgery to be trans. Because that's what daddy says. And I always do what daddy says. Because I'm a good, good girl. <laughs>